Mm. Mm. Sorry, Gurudev. Sorry, Masters. There are so many different ways to approach life, to approach spirituality. But there's one that if you can get it, it'll take you the whole way. And all the things that seem mystical and weird become very, very clear. To me, it's like trying to teach a fish that they're in water. That's a very hard thing to do because the fish has never been out of water. So they don't have a perspective. They don't see this medium they're in as a thing. It, it just is. So let's take a moment and we'll do this very different. Let's say that your consciousness, your awareness of being, was surrounded by an opaque ball, a fishbowl, let's say, big enough, or one of those diver helmets that would go around your head, and it was totally opaque. You can't see through it. You can see within it, because you're within it. But when you hit the edges of that bell, that diving bell, that helmet, you can't see past it. Now, let's say that it has always been like that. That's what it is. Now, it really does work to do this diving bell because you can't see the back, you can't see the top, you can't see the sides, but there's a little window right in front of your eyes. You can see outside. You can see what's going on outside. So say you're in your consciousness, your awareness of being is inside one of those things. And you can see what's in front of you because of the, op the transparency of this window. And that's all you can see. Now, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag early to tell you that there's much more outside of that bell than just what you can see in front of you. There's 360. There's a whole universe outside that bell. But you can't see that because it's opaque. So all you see is the edges of the bell, what's surrounding you, and you can see what's in front of you coming in through the window. I am telling you, though it may seem weird to you, that is exactly what is going on with your mind. There doesn't need to be a bell that is opaque that you can't see through. What you have going on is thoughts that are swimming around on the outsides where this bell would be. And these thoughts are powerful. They're thoughts like, you shouldn't have done that. She doesn't really like you. She said it to everybody. Watch it. Watch it. You know you got in trouble before. All right? Oh, my God. Remember what you did in 10th grade? Oh, my God. I'll bet they remember that. Don't go, don't go back to the reunion. It'll be so embarrassing. Like, you have thoughts, don't you? Okay? Now, those thoughts don't have to be opaque. They don't have to be like the diving bell that no matter where you look, you can't see around it. Why? If you only look at the thought, if your consciousness is so absorbed in the thought, it doesn't matter what's going on anywhere else because you're not going to be conscious of it. It's like if you walk into a room and there's all kinds of things in the room, but there's this TV in the corner. Not, not a big one, you know, just a 20-inch screen, flat screen. But what's on it fascinates you. It interests you your consciousness becomes absorbed into the TV. I don't have to make the rest of the room go away, do I? I don't have to clear it. I don't have to do anything. I have to make the people go away. I don't have to make them shut up. I don't have to do anything. Because your consciousness is not looking anywhere else, it can be dancing people. It doesn't matter what's going on because your consciousness is not going to see it. Why? Because your consciousness is absorbed in what it is that interests you. Therefore, that becomes a barrier, an opaque barrier, exactly the same as if you had this diving bell over you. Do you understand that? You can't see what else is there. You only see what you want to pay attention to. And what you want to pay attention to is your thoughts. You pay full attention to your thoughts. Whatever. The, <laughs> it's so funny. Can't even talk about it. All right. You you go and you're doing okay. We'll talk about what that means. And you go to your car where you parked in a parking lot, and there's a scratch. I guess it's a scratch. It could be dirt, but it looks like a scratch. Okay. That's it for you for the next few hours. Oh my God. What I do is I have scratched my car. I don't get a scratch in my car. I'm like, I can't get rid of it. Then that's what you pay attention to. 
Don't tell me that's the only thing going on in the world. <laughs> that's hilarious. There's 800 billion zillion things going on in the world, including around you. Just like when you watch the TV, there's a whole room full of people. There's all kinds of stuff going on. What I want you to get from this is I don't have to make an opaque helmet over your consciousness. If your consciousness does it to itself, I don't need the helmet. If your consciousness is only focusing on the things that you're interested in, which is you, <laughs> sorry, all right, that's, that's what it's about. You're not worried about scratching somebody else's car. I guarantee you, if there was a scratch in the car next to you, you say, oh, look, that car got a scratch. Hmm. That's the end of that. Is it scratching your car? It's going on for days. All right. So basically, because your consciousness, your awareness of being fixates on your thoughts, we don't have to build a barrier. That is the barrier. You create your own barrier because you limit your consciousness to your thoughts. Now, if you do this and the thoughts are flipping around and they go here and they go there, they're not the same thought. They change. Sometimes they'll say nice thing. Oh, my God, I hope I'm going to go to Hawaii. It's getting cold. I heard next few days. I bet it's nice in Hawaii. That's a thought. It's a thought that you're paying attention to. Therefore, it has the exact same effect. If I'm watching the TV and I'm watching one channel and I've convinced you that look what's happening. You're missing the rest of the room. You know, there's all kinds of people. There's all kinds of things going on. There's dancing bears, right? You can't see them because you're watching this TV show. Right? And you sit there and say, well, let's change the channel. That's not going to change anything. You just went from watching the news to watching a horror show to watching an action thing to watching, you know, dancing bears on TV. That's not the same thing as seeing what's going on. So I don't care if your thoughts are positive or negative. I mean, you'll see why positive thoughts are somewhat better, but I want you to understand this picture I'm painting you. If your consciousness, who's that? You. Hi, you in there? Hi, hi. All right. Your awareness of being is going to fixate on a thought, then you're not seeing anything else. Not that there's something wrong with thoughts. Do you understand that? There's nothing wrong with TV, but there's something drastically wrong with sitting down, missing the entire rest of your life, and getting absorbed in the TV or the web, excuse me, or your smartphone. <laughs> you understand that? There's some, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong, but I'm watching good things. It doesn't matter. You're missing everything else. Where you put your consciousness is your life. So if you limit your consciousness to your thoughts, what percentage of the universe are your thoughts? Ha, ha, ha. What if I said to you, what percentage of all the thoughts being created right now are yours? That's hilarious. That's not even funny, right? That's what you're missing. So if I watch one particular show on TV, I'm missing everything else that's going on. If I change the channel, I'm still missing everything else that's going on. I just watched one channel versus another. So you've seen one thought, you've seen them all. Okay? They're thoughts. If you limit your consciousness to a particular thought, or a handful of them, they don't have the same thought, pretty limited though you understand that there's this cycle of, of psychological mumbo jumbo going on in there right that's what they say well is she a is, is she a positive person or a negative one right in other words are the thoughts saying i can do this i'll be able to do this this will be neat i can succeed at this i can succeed at anything i want there those are nice positive thoughts negative thoughts i always fail i don't even want to try said, oh, fine one channel another channel i don't care in both cases your consciousness is limited to your thoughts and your thoughts are a tiny, tiny part of the universe. It's as though, okay, we're going to put a helmet on, right? And yours is black inside. It's just painted dark. There's nothing going on. And yours has little birdies. Give me a break. You're still opaqued within this helmet and limited to what you're experiencing. So when you pay attention to your thoughts, and you do, okay, totally, completely, and yes, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. That's a big deal to you. Sometimes they like, say, I like this. Sometimes they say, they don't like this. The point is you are paying attention when they say, I like it. If all of a sudden it goes there and says, I love that house. Oh, if I could have that house, that's, that's like exactly the kind of house I ever wanted to have. You're not paying attention to all the other houses. You're not paying attention to the people. You're not paying attention to the sky, the birds. All right. But if it's sitting there saying, I don't want, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want, I don't, I don't like this course. I don't drop this course. I don't want to take this course. I don't want to take the test. I don't, oh my God. I'm determined. I don't want, what's that? How many other things are going on in the universe? All right. So when you pay attention to a thought, you are not paying attention to the rest of the universe. You're only paying attention to that thought. So that's where the concept in deep Zen and deep teachings say positive, negative. That's just duality. It has nothing to do with positive, negative. It has nothing to do with like and dislike. You think it's wonderful if you have things that you like going on in your head, and you would be terrible if you have depressive thoughts going on in your head. To a deep person, 
they are the same. You are lost in your thoughts, and that's all you're paying attention to. So you can't see the rest. Now, we're going to talk about the, the positive of positive versus negative. We can do that. We don't have to go the whole way. But I want you to start to understand what the non-dual teachings are sitting there saying to you, all right? It's not a question of positive and negative. It's not a question of like and dislike. It's a question of, are you in there, the consciousness, limiting yourself to your thoughts? The answer is yes. And what is your universe made of? My thoughts. (laughs) They're made of my thoughts. Whatever my thoughts are doing, I'm paying attention to. Therefore, I haven't seen the rest of the universe. Now, I told you to let the cat out of the bag early so we'll work with it. What if you weren't paying attention to your thoughts? Since it's not a diving bell over your head, it's not I have to say, what if you took the bell off, right? I would just say you've limited yourself by limiting your consciousness to your thoughts. You understand that? What if you stopped doing that? What if you did not fixate your consciousness on the television show? You'd see the rest of the room. How hard is that? Nothing is nothing. Just don't limit your consciousness to one thing, right? What if you did not fixate your consciousness on your thoughts? What would happen? Mayor Baba very high being, fully enlightened, said the following. And now you understand what it means. This is deep stuff. Man minus mind equals God. God? That's big. That's more than just seeing the rest of the room. All right? That's exactly what's going on. Because you are limiting your consciousness to these independent little thoughts, you are not seeing what you're capable of seeing, which is everything. Period. Your consciousness is limited to what you're looking at. What are you capable of seeing? Since you've heard that your consciousness happens to be universal, it's a very great thing. If you're not limiting it to the finite, you're able to experience the infinite. And that's what all of deep spirituality is about. That's what enlightenment is. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is I'm sitting in a room staring at a TV. There's tons of other things going on in the room. If I stop staring at the TV, how long does it take before I see the rest? A billionth of a second. How hard is it to see the rest? Nothing, is it? Once you stop limiting your consciousness to one thing. So what the masters are teaching you, and this is very high stuff, is that if you stop staring at your thoughts, where do you see what you're looking at? Because you who's looking is a great thing. The consciousness is is unlimited. It's spirit. It's infinite, all right? Well, if it's infinite, why don't I feel infinite? Because you're staring at the finite. Why don't I see the rest of the room? Everybody else saw the rest of the room. Because you stared at the TV. It's not mystical, is it? (laughs) It's a very straightforward thing. You who's staring at your thoughts is the highest thing that ever walked the face of the earth. Period. Somebody once went to Master Yogananda, fully enlightened being, and said, Master, I want to know God. I want to know God. He pestered him. I want to know God, Master. Help me. I want to know God. He turned to him just nonchalantly and said, He dwells right behind your every thought. What dwells right behind your every thought? You who notice the thought. Otherwise, you wouldn't know it was there. They're all saying the same thing. You, the consciousness, the awareness of being, there are no words. You are a very great thing. What did Christ say? The kingdom is within you. That's not so complicated. What it's saying is, when you stop being fixated on your thoughts... You're going to know who you are. Otherwise, you think you're the thought. You literally think you're the thought. If I say to you, who are you? Say, I'm Sally Jones. You do this in the book. That's all right. You're not Sally Jones. That's a collection of letters out of the alphabet. Somebody gave you a name and you said, that's who you are? What if they called you Paul Wilson? You're Now you're Paul Wilson? Okay, it's ridiculous. That's It's just a thought in your head. All right, who am I? I'm so-and-so's daughter. You are not. You're not Sally Jones. You're not so-and-so's daughter. You're not so-and-so's wife or husband. If you're so-and-so's wife, then who were you before you met them? You are the consciousness that is in there. Before you met your husband, you were, you know, this kind of person, or you thought of yourself this way or that way. Then you met the person. Then you started having the thought, I'm with this guy. She, she's with me. You know that one. <laughs> I'm with her, all right? And you start having that thought, and that's in there, and now you stare at that thought. And somebody says, who are you? And the thought comes up, right? I'm Peter's wife. You are not Peter's wife. You are the consciousness that looked at the thought that said Peter's wife, right or wrong. 
Okay, it didn't used to say Peter's wife, and guess what? Someday it might not. <laughs> if Peter misbehaves, it may not be Peter's wife anymore. But I understand, who were you before Peter? Who are you after Peter? And who are you with Peter? You're the same person. You're the consciousness that's noticing that I didn't know Peter. Now you know Peter. So you have the thoughts about Peter. Then Peter didn't turn out so good, so he gets thrown away. But by the way, the thought didn't get thrown away, right? He's my ex. It went from wife to ex. I love it. It's just a thought. It has nothing to do with you. None of it. You are the consciousness that is fixated on these thoughts that are popping up. The fact that the thoughts change, I'm sorry, I'm a yogi. I don't care. I don't care if the thought says, Peter, Peter who? Peter? Oh, he's my husband. I love him so much. Peter? Yeah. Don't even go near him. That was my ex. I got to know him. I got, I've had enough Peter for a lifetime. Right? I don't care what the thought says. I care about it. It's the same you watching that thought, isn't it? All right? And if you get absorbed in that thought, you do this thing called identify with it. Instead of realizing I am the one who's behind every thought, you are the thought. <laughs> you, are, you make this collection of thoughts about what happened to you, what you liked, what you didn't like. You got this whole barrage in there, right? Just like the helmet. It's surrounding you and it keeps talking, right? And you keep listening. All right? That's another, I'm taking some very deep to you tonight. Another very deep thing, right? Some people think that spirituality is about mind control, about stopping the mind. It is not about mind control. It's not about stopping the mind. It's about ceasing to watch the mind. What do I care what the mind does? Do I have to control the elephants to be okay? Do I have to control the ants? Do I have to control the road? I have a lot of things to control, aren't there? Right? Why do I have to control my mind? I just have to not care about it. I just to sit there and say, oh, those are thoughts. <laughs> Look at those thoughts. They come and they go and they change. <laughs> They're weird. What's it got to do with me? Nothing. He dwells right behind your every thought. To a deep being, to a spiritual being, God is not off somewhere sitting in a chair with a beard judging you, right? It is, Muktananda said it, meditate on the self. What does that mean? You, in there? Hi. Meditate on the self. Honor and worship your own being. For God dwells within you as you. He dwells right behind every thought. Man minus mind equals God. All saying the same thing, aren't they? That is, you who's in there, who's watching the mind, or where you want to go, you're something very, very great. The mind, not so great. There's nothing wrong with the mind. You shouldn't think that I'm saying something's wrong with the mind. The mind is brilliant. Your mind is an inborn, indwelling computer. It has memory, it has capability of cre creativity, it has capability of, of, of analysis and so on. It's a computer. It's a beautiful thing. It's an unbelievable thing, this thing called mind. You can do so many things with it. It's, oh my God, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Okay, what have you done with it? OMG. I took this tremendously beautiful instrument, machine that was given to me, and what I did with it is very straightforward. Let's get this straight. It's not the mind's fault, it's your fault. This is what you do with your mind. I'm not okay. Who? Me in here. Well, why? Mickey said you were God. Yeah, but I'm not looking that way. I'm looking out. You understand that? I'm not looking at my own being. I'm looking away from my own being. So I feel lost. I don't know who I am. I don't feel home. I don't feel centered. I don't feel clear. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel contented. Of course you don't. You're looking away from yourself. So then I need to find myself. I love that one. I'm trying to find myself. Did you go to Europe yet? Find yourself in Europe. You're inside. <laughs> Aren't you? Hi. So basically, you're out there looking for yourself because you're not comfortable because you lost yourself. Why did you lose yourself? Because you're looking at everything other than yourself. When you look out, a light shines out on an object. Make believe the light was conscious. The light doesn't know who it is. It just knows who the object is because it's illumining the object. So the light knows itself as the one that's illumining the object. No, it's not. The light has nothing to do with the object. It just happens to be shining on the object. If you move it, it shines on another object. It has nothing. It doesn't leave a piece of it with the old, old one, does it? It has nothing to do with it. It's the same thing with you. Consciousness shines out away from itself. Therefore, it loses its sense of self. So then you're not okay. All right? So why? Because you're lost. And you're trying to find something that will make you feel better. All right? So your mind is what you're using as the instrument to do that. 
And you're saying to your mind, mine, I'm not okay. I'm scared. I'm insecure. I feel rejected. I don't feel anybody likes me. I don't feel the love I want to feel. I don't feel the purpose in my life. I don't feel blah, 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 blah. Okay? So the lost soul, the lost consciousness, goes to the mind and says, please help me figure out what I should do about this. And you went to this computer mind. It's a brilliant mind. It split the atom. It figured out there was atoms. It flew to the moon. That's quite a mind. It figured out how to make darkness light, didn't it? It's an amazing thing, right? You went to that exact same mind, and you said, I'm not okay. What needs to happen for me to be okay, and how should I do it? That's so simple. Look how simple it was. I'm not okay. What needs to happen for me to be okay, and how do I make it happen? I just, those are three sentences. That's all that's going on, isn't it? Every moment of your life, that's all that ever went on. I'm not okay. What do I need to get that toy? Get that person to like you. Get that house. Get that blouse. Get your hair done. Isn't that what's happening? Right? You're going to your mind, and your mind is making up things and saying, this will work, and this won't work. How did your mind get that idea? What did your mind figure out what to say? Yours says, I need a nose job. I'm not happy. The other one says, I love my nose. Oh, my God. It's so distinctive. It's Roman. Yeah, who knows what the mind's going to say, right? I know what it's going to say. The mind is a computer. It analyzes everything it says off of its data, just like a computer does. It doesn't make stuff up by itself. It has data. What is the data your mind has? The experiences you've had in the past. You had some, haven't you? Okay, those experiences come in and they're either comfortable or uncomfortable, correct? Somebody comes up to you and compliments you. God, you're, you got a beautiful nose. Anybody tell you how beautiful your nose is, right? I'm in kindergarten, by the way, all right? And somebody else then somebody says something else, you know? But, you know, your fingers are weird. Your hands are small. Basically, they're saying nice things. They're saying insulting things. And basically, this leaves an impression on your mind. It, it leaves the impression that this is nice and that's not nice. Guess what if you go to your mind in the middle of the night trying to fall asleep but you can't because you're not happy and you go to your mind and say, what needs to happen for me to be okay? You need to find that person. Go on the web and find that person in kindergarten that thought your nose was so beautiful. I bet you could find her. You remember her name? And you start thinking like that. Oh my God, what a cute little mind. You did this. Do you understand that? You went to the mind as a computer and said, oh mine, Guruji, God, Right? Tell me what needs to happen for me to feel better. Can you relate to that? Do you understand that? You're doing it all the time. And tell me what better not happen so I don't feel worse. Because you've had bad experiences too. And that's it. That's where the thoughts come from. I did it very simple. That's why your mind says one thing and hers says another. All right? That's why yours says one thing today and says something totally different next week. Because you had a different experience. Changes all the time, doesn't it? Every time an experience comes in, so you get to the point where you understand what is going on. I am in here. It is not comfortable to me because I don't know who I am. I'm lost. So I'm constantly trying to create situations that my mind says will make me feel better and avoid situations that my mind says will make me feel worse. And my mind got this idea because of its past experiences. If you get that, you get everything you now know more than what 99.99% of the people ever walked the face of the earth. They were just running around trying to make it happen. The normal human being is staring at their thoughts, and their thoughts are made up of their past experiences, and their thoughts are conceptual ideas of what needs to happen for me to be okay and what needs to not happen so I don't get worse. And then how do I make it happen? And that's your whole life. You're not careful. That will be your entire life. You would stare at those thoughts. They'll change. They'll come up. And it'll say, oh, I like him. Oh, my God. And then all of a sudden, it'll say, next time. You mean, eh, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't like him. I don't like him. I'm not sorry. I took this date. I'm so uncomfortable. I can't wait to get home. And you actually listen. That's what's hilarious. You actually listen to this garbage that is being created in your mind. So as long as you're doing that, what is going to happen is you are limiting your universe to you. That's all, right? And you'll never know what's meant, how great you are, because you're just limited to the TV show you're watching. And it will happen your entire life. The mind is very strong, and it will sit there and tell you, I know what's good for you, because I have these past experiences. It's absurd. You know how many experiences you didn't have compared to the ones you did have? 
at any given moment how many things are going on compared to what you're actually experiencing. Like 800 billion zillion. So you don't know anything. You understand that? I wonder if that gets through, right? You, it's, what's going on in your mind is statistically insignificant. It is just based on the minimal, absurdly little amount of experience you're having at the moment. You're missing everything else that's going on. Everything else that's going on is just as important, right? Everything else that you're not seeing is just as important as what you are seeing, isn't it? It's all representative of the whole, but you're only seeing this tiny little bit. And you build every single thought, the whole conceptual model inside your head is based on this minuscule, meaningless amount of experience you've had. I don't like the color red. Color, it's too bright. I, Okay, I guarantee if your blankie was red, right, and you loved your blankie and they didn't take it away too soon, you'd love red. It has nothing to do with anything. You're just doing this stuff. So if you keep doing this, your life will be limited to nothing. It's limited to, to the noise that your mind is making about your past experiences and that it's telling you to manipulate the world in front of you so that it matches this stuff. And you're just going to struggle. It's just a big struggle. So what spirituality is about is not about stopping the mind or not liking the mind, and it's not about any of this stuff. It's about realizing I'm in here and I'm addicted to my mind. You're more addicted to your mind than anybody is to drugs. In fact, the reason people do drugs is because their mind is bothering them. So basically, you have to decide what I want to do. Do I want to keep staring at my mind and doing everything it says, or do I want to learn how to not stare at my mind so that I can explore the nature of myself, the nature of being, which is what all the spirituality is about. So the question becomes, how do you do that? Let's say you decide, well, it is kind of a drag staring at my mind, isn't it? Okay, I mean, I'm telling you, your mind is a problem. It's not happy. It causes you trouble. It tells you all kinds of negative things. It's anxious, isn't it? It gets stressed. It gets all kinds of stuff. Right? So what you try to do when that's going on is to create situations outside that, that they don't make you more comfortable. They make your mind more comfortable. Your mind doesn't like that person. You better avoid her. Right? Your mind likes that person. You better get her to hang out with you. If your mind said the opposite, you'd be doing the opposite. You're a complete slave to trying to appease your mind. I, the example I've been using lately is you got a two, two three-year-old kid throws tantrums. Well, that's not comfortable to be in a department store and have your kids throwing tantrums, right? Well, what should you do? Don't get him what he wants. All that's doing is reinforcing that pattern. You do it to your mind all the time. Anything your mind wants, you try to get for it. It says, I want this, you try to get it. I don't want this, you try to get away from it. You, you go to have lunch, you say, oh my God, it's going to be so exciting. I get to have this lunch. You sit down, your mind says, ah, that's not what I thought it was going to be, Right? There's not, there's not enough chips. I thought there'd be more chips, right? Why don't they get more chips? Enjoying yourself yet? No, all right? And so all of a sudden the waiter comes up and says, oh, by the way, would you like more chips? I see he didn't give you a lot of chips. Wow, you love the waiter, you love the place, and it was an intervention of God. <laughs> I swear to God, it was divine intervention. I didn't say anything, and all of a sudden there's more chips on the plate. Your mind decides everything, do you understand that? If on the other hand, the waiter came and said, oh my God, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong plate. There's way too many chips on that plate. That was meant for the other person to ask for more plate. You'll never go back to the restaurant that the devil did that. <laughs> Try to see your mind is God. It's not, but it is to you. It determines who you like, who you don't like. Where you... Get a job. Have your mind say, boy, this is exciting. I can't wait to see what they're going to give me to do. I have my dream job. I tell everybody that. Then go to the job and on the second day, they say, oh, by the way, uh, the floor needs some sweeping. Could you do that? He goes, the, the boss is coming in. Your mind says, I'm not sweeping that floor. All right? I got a master's degree. Master's degree people don't sweep floors. <laughs> wow. What happened to the dream job? Didn't take much, did it? Right? I'm telling you, will you please look? You are completely addicted to this helmet you're wearing. But I told you, it's not a helmet. It's the, you're staring at things. <laughs> There's plenty of room in there to look at something else, but you don't. Boom. <laughs> look right. Okay? So basically, the spiritual path is not one of changing the world to look spiritual. The spiritual path is not one of controlling your mind or doing something. The spiritual path is very, very simple. It's not easy to do, but it's very simple to understand. And it's worth working with. Well, why are you 
limiting your consciousness to your thoughts. If your thought all of a sudden goes there and says, I don't want to sleep that floor, why do you listen? Right? Why don't you just say, I can't wait to sleep it. You just go sleep the floor. Hear me? Why would you listen to your mind? Why would you listen to that garbage? It's like the kid that's throwing the tantrum. Which toy? How's that feel? Which toy, darling? This one? This one? Oh, let me put... What are you, crazy? There's no way in the world you should be doing that with that kid, is it? You do it with yourself all the time, don't you? All the time. I don't want to study. I got to test my... I don't want to study tonight. I just don't want to study tonight. I don't want to do it. I don't... Wow, that's just great. That's just great. Then after the test, you get a D. Why don't I study? This is ridiculous. What's wrong with me? I do that all the time. So there you go. Kill yourself in the beginning. Procrastinate and bother yourself at the end. If you listen to the mind, you are dead. It has no foundation. It has no basis. It's just a bunch of made-up stuff based on your past experiences. And it doesn't know what it's doing. To me, when you get in a car, you all drive. You made it out here, right? How many times have you gotten into a car, had it driving down the expressway, and decided not to keep your hand on the steering wheel? How about never, right? How many times have you decided, oh, there's someone going in the back seat. I think I'll join them. And jumped in the back seat. Just left the thing to drive itself. You do it with your mind all the time. There's nobody driving. It just says whatever it wants to say, and you go over there, and it says this, you go over there. It's absolutely absurd. And at some point, you see, I'm there. You catch on. That thing doesn't know what it's talking about. It's just whatever somebody said last is what it wants to do or doesn't want to do. (laughs) Yes or no? Okay? And so you start to say, I want out. I want out of this. I want out of the limitation of being addicted to these crazy thoughts that are not taking me anywhere. They're not taking me anywhere. They're just basically saying, I'm not comfortable. What do you think you need to do to get comfortable? I am comfortable. What do I need to do to keep it, to clean and hold on to it? Neither of which works, does it? Okay? It doesn't create comfort. It creates neurosis. All right. So now, if you understand, is there a way to free yourself? It's called liberation. Is there a way to free yourself from this predicament you find yourself in? The answer is, of course there is. Why? Because you're the one who's doing it. (laughs) That's like saying, if I walk into a room, there's all these things going on, and I'm watching a TV instead... Is there a way to not? Of course there's a way to not. Don't. It's not like it takes a he-man or a superwoman to do this thing. You're the one who's staring at your thoughts. Now we're going to do this. There's time and I'll work it through with you. I'm not staring at your thoughts. I'm not putting a gun to your head making you stare at your thoughts. You're willfully staring at your thoughts. And everything it says, you jump. It says, jump, you jump. Right? I, I, I'm not comfortable here anymore. I thought I would like to party, but I don't. I want to leave. You leave. You don't even think it's funny. You know, it's perfectly normal. It's running your life. <laughs> it's crazy. Buy a car. Buy your first car. Right? Love it. All right? Until it says, eh, I'm not sure I got the right one. What, what are you doing? What are you doing listening to that? I have to get you to the point. You don't know how not to. Will you understand how important it is to not listen to that? You can listen to math. You can listen to creativity. You can listen to creating music. You can listen to all kinds of constructive, beautiful things that the mind is doing. It's this personal stuff. What's the personal stuff? I'm not okay. How do I be okay? That's the personal stuff. That got nothing to do with math. Got nothing to do with creativity and music. And you understand that? Okay. It's I'm not okay. What do I need? What needs to happen for me to be okay? And how do I make it happen? That's the personal mind. Did I explain it well this time? You got a little bit of that? I'm telling you, that's all that's going on in there. <laughs> You're lucky you get any analytical thoughts because it, they're in the backdrop of constantly this. All right? So basically, how do you get out? You don't get out by appeasing it, just like you don't stop that kid from throwing tantrums by appeasing him, giving him what he wants. Never, under any conditions, right? You don't get out by beating it up. People go through that stage. You understand that? Everyone goes through the stage of get it what it wants and I'll be okay. If I could just have what I wanted, I'd be okay. Ooh, that sounds nice. Right? Well, the kid throwing a tantrum says the same thing. So does everybody else. <laughs> everybody in this whole planet is saying, if I could just have everything the way I wanted, I'd be okay. All right. And guess what? You know what that's saying? I'll never be okay. Because it's never going to be the way I want. <laughs> it's never going to be the way I want, so I'll never be okay. So, boy, you really messed yourself up there. 
So then you go through a stage which people inevitably go through. I try to help you skip this stage because, boy, did I do it big time, all right, which is I'm going to beat this thing up. All right. I I'm, I don't want that mind going on in here. I don't want that happening. I don't want to listen to that stuff. I don't want it in there. And, ooh, give me the creeps. Right. So that's like and so that's that's like Zen. Like, <laughs> OK, that's a type of spirituality. You know, there's a real ascetic type renunciation and I'll beat it out of me. You hear me? No, you won't. I tried. No, you won't. Right. There's a reason it's there. As long as there's a reason it's there, all you can do is suppress it. They're going to beat it out of you. Why is it there? I told you why it's there. Always go back to what I taught you. It's there because you're not okay, and you went to the mind and said, what needs to happen for me to be okay, and how do I make it happen? Now, if you told it to do that, and now you're beating it up for doing that, that that's not going to work too good. That's like your left hand fighting your right. <laughs> no one wins there. At least you don't. <laughs> okay? You can't fight with your mind. You have to find out why it's doing what it's doing and remove the reason it's doing that and remove the reason that you're so interested in what it's doing. There's two ways you can work with spirituality. One is to undercut, why is the mind doing this? Why is there so much personal mind? Why is it judging every single thing about me and everybody else? <laughs> right? Why is it so weird? Why does it have so many problems? Why does it care so much about why, what people think about it? And by the way, people who don't think anything about you, nobody even knows you. That's what's nice about hanging out with a high being. They interact with you, not your body, not your mind, not your emotions. Hi, you in there? So am I. Hi. Hi. <laughs> right? And that's the end of it. What a wonderful relationship. It's very nice. You care about what people think about you, but what you mean is whether they like your nose or how far apart your eyes are. Or how long your arms are. Or who the heck knows? You know what I'm saying? Do they like your body? Well, you're not your body. So, you know, you stand in a mirror. Stand in a mirror. You see your body? Who? Who does? Who sees your body? Who's looking out through those eyes? There ain't no arms and legs in there. Okay? So you basically realize, I have completely sold out. I told my mind to do this, and now I can't beat my mind up for doing it. So there's two ways to work with spirituality, and you'll work with both of them. One is look at that mind and realize what a mess I made of this beautiful computer. <laughs> it's like it's weird now. It's all, it doesn't get uptight and have all kinds of anxieties and fears and self-consciousness and embarrassments. And, ah. <laughs> okay? It's terrible. So I did this. Why? Because I went to this mind who knows nothing as a computer and said, how does everybody and everything need to be for me to be okay? And how do I make it be that way? All right. And so it's just doing that. It does it all night. You can't go fall asleep because it's doing that. Can, can anybody understand what I just said? Can you relate to that? Is that simple? That's what your mind is doing. Trying to figure out what everybody and everything needs to do for you to be okay. And then how to make it be that way and figure out what better not happen or you'll get worse and figure out how to make it n never happen. If I take that box, does that not explain what's going on in there? So now how do you undo it? How do you do Because you can liberate yourself. You can free yourself. And that's a beautiful life. It's a totally different life. One, why is the mind doing that? I told you why. Because you're not okay and you asked it what needs to happen for you to be okay. Well, if you don't want it doing that, you should stop asking it to do that. That's the technique. Right? So if something happens, it's going to rain tomorrow. Don't ask your mind, is that okay with you? It's, what kind of a thing is that? It's going to rain whether you like it or not. Why would you even go to your mind and ask, do you like it? And the third Zen patriarch, we're going to get deep now. It's one of the deepest writings ever written from the third Zen patriarch. Right? It's called the Treatise on Faith Mind. It starts off with, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. One of the deepest lines ever written. But he goes on and he says, to set aside what you like from what you dislike is the disease of the mind. Well, Why would you decide you don't want it to rain tomorrow? Why would you decide you don't want it to rain tomorrow when you have no control of whether it rains or not? All you're going to do is make yourself sick. Why would you decide that you want the driver in front of you driving five miles over the speed limit, which is the way you like to drive, when they're driving 15 miles below the speed limit and you have no control over how they're driving? Why would you do that? Why would you let your mind do that? It does do that, doesn't it? And then it starts talking to the person. Come on, the speed limit. You see the sign down. You see the speed limit. All right? It's kind of fun, right? <laughs> no, it's not fun. It creates nervousness and anxiety and all kinds of junk. So the question is, 
if you don't judge, you won't have a preference for or against. If you sit there and say, the weather is none of my business. How the person drives in front of me is none of my business. If you want to pass, that's fine. But if you can't pass, it's none of your business. It's just reality. It's what's happening. So basically, you start understanding the weather. Start with the weather. It's going to be cold tomorrow. Is that okay with you? Don't you dare answer that. Don't you dare. Here, you know what that sounds like to me? If I say, is that okay with you? You know, Saturn has rings. Is that okay with you? You wouldn't answer that question, would you? I mean, it's like, oh, I ain't answering that question. That's a stupid question. It's just as stupid to say, if it's going to be cold tomorrow morning, is that okay with you? You have no right to have an opinion for or against the thing. Your opinions are making you sick, right? Especially about things you can't do anything about. Let's start, I call that low-hanging fruit. The ones that's going to happen no matter what your opinion is, therefore the only thing your opinion does is make you sick. So you start to work with yourself and you sit there and say, why would I do that? Why would I say, no, it's not okay that it's going to rain tomorrow? No, it's not okay it's going to be cold tomorrow. No, it's not okay that I got a little, little zit came out of my cheek. No, it's not okay. Well, then you're not okay because it happened. I'm not saying you can't do anything about it. The zit part, the weather you can't do anything about, all right? But I'm just trying to show you what we do. We resist reality by making our minds sick about it. A spiritual person starts right there and says, I don't need to do that. I can handle the weather. The weather changes. I like it. It'd be fun. It'd be cold. I'll bundle up. Have fun. Don't do this. Don't judge. Instead, you sit there and say, I am going to stop bothering my mind about things that are irrelevant. I'm sitting on a planet, spinning in the middle of nowhere. There are going to be things that happen in this world that aren't particularly comfortable when they come in. Is that okay with me? And you say, yes. It's a rhetorical question. It's okay if it gets cold. It's okay if it rains. It's okay if my hair turns gray when I get older. It's okay if I didn't say hello. It's okay if the driver in front of me is driving not the way I want them to, right? These are not things I could do something about, and I don't want to bother myself about them, and I don't want to bother my mind about them, right? It's not that your mind is bothering you. You're bothering your mind about it. You're saying, mind, figure out why I didn't say hello. Somebody doesn't call you for 10 minutes. You're sitting there trying to figure out. <laughs> you don't know why they didn't call. Why don't you just enjoy the 10 minutes? Do a mantra, watch TV, do something interesting, have fun. No, you're going to angst yourself out. Why? What good did that do? None. Do you understand that? That's like keeping your hand on the wheel when you're driving. Learn to steer. Learn to work in there. Don't go to the mine and tell it to figure out things that are none of its business. And the only reason you're told to do is you're not comfortable. I'm not comfortable, mine. Figure out why she didn't call yet. You see how absurd that is? You don't know why she didn't call, <laughs> okay? Your mind's just going to make up a bunch of stuff, and it's going to make you neurotic and make you sick, and you will not enjoy those 10 minutes. I want you to enjoy those 10 minutes. It's like a vacation. There's nothing I have to do. I'm not supposed to do anything right now, but wait for the phone call. Great, I'll wait for the phone call. Oh, but I hope she takes 20 minutes. I'm having fun. You can do this, all right? Nobody's telling you to go to your mind and say, I'm not comfortable, figure it out. Make yourself sick about it. Hear me? It takes time to learn to do this. So one way you work with yourself is you stop bothering your mind about things that are none of your business. I once taught you, it's like if the driver in front of you is driving slower than the speed limit, that's not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about it. It's going to get cold tomorrow morning. That's not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the fact that it's going to be cold. How about we stop doing that? That's a spiritual path. So how do you do this? You start by looking at your mind. This is a very beautiful way. And apologizing. See, I'm not against the mind. I'm not against the computer. I don't like what you did with it. You hear me? And your mind doesn't like it either. It doesn't want to be neurotic. <laughs> okay? You apologize. You sit down and you say to your mind, I am so sorry. I gave you an impossible task. I told you to figure out how everybody and everything in the world needs to be for me to be okay. And you have these past experiences and you built this whole model about how everything needs to be for me to be okay. And then you're trying to make it be that way. I am so sorry. I've driven you crazy. I've made you neurotic. Right? You don't know how to, you don't know anything. You go out on a date, you wear something. Somebody says, God, you look really good. Wow, you look just great. You know what? You're in trouble when you try to go out on the second date. What are you going to wear? 
If you wear the same thing, it looks absurd, right? You can have multiple clothes. If you wear something different, maybe they won't like it. And you will sit there and take, put outfit on after outfit and try different things and ask somebody and go to the store. Maybe somebody, oh, my God, that is called being neurotic. You don't think it is because everybody else is, all right? But that's neurotic. That's ridiculous. You go out on a day, you wore something. You didn't know the first day what the person liked. Wear something else. Put on what you like. Put something you feel good about, not what you think they will like you about. That's, in essence, saying, I'm not okay. This whole thing's about making me be okay. No, it's not. Wouldn't it be fun to be able to just put on what you want to wear and just have fun? And the person sits there and says, God, you have, you wear such interesting stuff. It's so different than last time, right? Or the person sits there and says, God, that's really different. <laughs> And just have fun. You're sitting on a planet spinning in the middle of nowhere. Do not let this be about figuring out how you're going to make the neurotic mind feel better. Because it's not going to work. So you sit there and apologize to your mind. This is serious. You say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can do math. You can do calculus. All right. You can do other things. You can do this. You can figure things out. You can play music. Learn to read. Learn to play tennis. You can learn all kinds of things. I love you. You're a beautiful mind. I am so sorry I gave you the task of trying to make me be okay because you don't have any idea how to make me be okay. You don't have to do that anymore. I'm okay. You say, I'm okay. I'll be okay. I'm not okay, but I'll be okay. Because if the mind stops making you neurotic, you will be okay. You hear me? Because you are okay, but you're staring at something that's not the broken mind. Okay, so that's one methodology is to try, you can work with your mind. The Gita says one should raise the self with self, not trample down the self. In other words, you're the higher self, that's the lower self. Raise it up, help it out. I used to teach people, you're the parent, you're more conscious than that little mess in there, aren't you? Gets all neurotic about stupid stuff. Treat it like you would a child. Your your little 12-year-old daughter comes home. Oh, it's Johnny. He said he liked me. Now he talked to somebody else. It's like cute. It's cute. Like, believe me, there'll be more of that. <laughs> okay? You feel compassion. You feel love. It's not a major problem. You understand that? Be like that with yourself. Help her. Right? Raise her. Let her know you're okay. She'll be okay. There's something strong in there. So basically, you work with yourself that way to raise yourself, to not continue putting this heavy trip on yourself. You do the best. But aren't you, what about your interaction with life? It's very simple. Do the best that you can with whatever life puts in front of you. Why? That's like saying, if I'm playing a football game, why should I try to win? If I'm playing basketball, why should I try to get it in? Well, if you don't want to get it in, don't play basketball. You understand that? Because it's no fun. I don't want you on my team. You want to be on a team, right? Play volleyball? Eh, I don't care if I hit it or don't hit it. What's the purpose? Who cares? No, you you play a sport because you try your best. There's no reason. Golf is the ultimate example. You want to get the ball in the hole? Walk up there and drop it in. Hole in one every single time is not hard at all, right? But that's not fun. What's fun is the challenge, isn't it? The challenge to do the best that you can, and teamwork's all the more so because then all of you are working together to create this energy to do the best that you can. Hear me? And it's fun, and it's educational. It's great. Life is exactly the same. If you're in school, do the best that you can. If you're in a relationship, do the best that you can. If you're learning tennis, do the best that you can. For what reason? None. Just the fun of doing the best that you can. Bring your best game to whatever you're doing, and you're going to be the best that you can be. That's what it means. So don't wait until, but I don't want to do the best I can unless my mind likes it. No, I already taught you. That's not going to work. You hear me? If the boss says, if you got yourself a master's degree in, in engineering and the CEO's coming in and says, oh my God, will you sweep the floor for me? Right? Get enthused and excited to be the best floor sweeper that ever walked the face of the earth. Hear me? Let's get there, do it, and get into it, right? Guess what's going to happen? You'll get the raise, man, like, right? It's so silly. So learn to do the best that you can. Do not allow your mind to determine how you're doing. Don't let its likes and dislikes. And It's like some people say, I need to find my passion. No, you need to stop blocking yourself so that you don't feel passion. It has to be, I am passion. Not I'll find my passion. I am passion. 
Now, let me express it. I'll express it sweeping the floor. I'll express it in a relationship. I'll express it buying a new car. I'll express it playing a sport. I'll express it in every single thing I do because I'm not blocked and limited to the mind. I'm not staring at the mind that's limiting me to itself. If I'm not staring at that, I have my whole being all the time. I have all this energy and this juice and shakti and chi is all rushing up inside of me because I didn't limit the portal that it had to match the mind. So that's one way to do it, is to work with your mind, to raise it, to expand the things you like. Isn't it true that you get turned on when what you like happens? Like more things. Yeah, you expanded your mind. <laughs> you expanded your world, right? Instead of saying, these are the few things I like, I really get turned on when they happen, now I have to make them happen. I'd rather have you say, I want to expand how many things turn me on then it'd be much easier to live your whole life. So that's one method, this whole thing of working with yourself, working with your mind, raising it, expanding it that way, right? And so on. The other, which is very, very deep, and and you'll have to work with that first one first, is just start realizing what's happening, which is, I don't have to take the mind with me. Why am I looking at it? If my mind says, I don't like this, it's like a cloud passing by. What do I care what it likes and dislikes? <laughs> it is of no interest to me in any way, shape, or form, right? I've been there. I've done that. I, it's just crazy. And you learn to work with your consciousness instead of working with your mind. It's a high state, okay? That's where great beings work. You don't work with the world to make it match your mind. You don't work with your mind to have it do this, that, or the other thing. You work with you, the consciousness itself, And you sit there and realize my consciousness is being drawn down into what the mind is saying. I don't have to do that. And that's where the deep spiritual practices come from. All right? Somebody once asked Sam Yogananda, who said, God dwells right behind every thought. Right? They asked him, he used to teach this thing called Kriya Yoga, type of meditation. They said it was the most scientific method of enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera. And this was back in the 30s. He was in America. And so once a news reporter, somebody asked him, In a public setting, Master Yogananda, Swami Yogananda, is there any other technique other than Kriya Yoga which guarantees enlightenment and self-realization in this lifetime? And he shocked all his disciples that he taught all this Kriya Yoga stuff to, right? And he said, yes. And he said, well, what is that? And he said, take your attention and put it at the point between your eyebrows and never take it off. We know that is the third eye or the sixth chakra, whatever you want. That's not the point. The point is take your attention, your awareness, and put it at the point between your eyebrows and never take it off. Well, guess what? That's guaranteed enlightenment. Why? Because you're not watching your thoughts. You're watching the point between your eyebrows. You've learned how to take your consciousness and keep it focused at a given point inside. It's a very holy, it's a powerful point. You'll find out someday that energy, Shakti, can go up there and pull all your consciousness to it. So basically, from inside, you learn to put your gaze there, to put your consciousness there. Then all of a sudden, a thought starts to form. This is deep. You have to meditate deep to get to this point. A thought starts to form. You'll feel that it pulls your consciousness off at the point between your eyebrows and onto the thought. We don't let it. You just shift your consciousness back. And all of a sudden, the thought just goes away. And you realize the thought is nothing if you don't pay attention to it. And so if you're paying attention to something else, be it the point between your eyebrows, be it a mantra, right? But if you start saying a mantra over and over again inside your head, now the mind wants to think other things. Put your consciousness on the mantra. So you're shifting consciousness as opposed to messing with the mind or messing with the world. Do you understand that? And that's very powerful. That's what meditation is. The ability to work with consciousness itself and put it where you want to put it. And that's what meditation is about, learning to do this. So be it a mantra, be it whatever. What I teach you is thoughts are going to be created. The highest thing you can do is not care. You don't have to answer it. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to justify it. Don't get in intellectually arguing with it. Well, you know, it's not really that way. Don't. It won. You're in your mind. (laughs) It won, all right? You have to sit there and say, thoughts are like clouds. They come and they go. Hear me? Nice ones, not nice ones. I like it. I don't like it. Right? You, the consciousness, center inside and relax as the thoughts pass by. You won't be able to do it at first. But over time, you will be able to do it. Practice makes perfect. So the thought gets created. Why didn't Sally say hello? Just relax. Relax. But but no buts. Relax. But it, it will want to get involved in the thought. 
because that's your addiction. Do you understand that? Just relax. What do I do if I'm trying to stop smoking? I want I want to smoke. Relax. No, relax. If you don't relax, you're going to smoke. If you relax, it'll pass by. The urge will pass by. It's the same thing. Just keep relaxing, relaxing, and let things pass by. Things you need to deal with, deal with them. But this junk, I'm not saying you don't interact with the world. I'm not saying you don't do the best you can. I'm saying this noise this noise about I'm not okay, how do I be okay, and the mind's telling you all this garbage and you're getting upset about everything. You don't want to do that. You want to be free and free to express yourself, free to do the best you can. Can you learn to not listen to your mind? That's what it boils down to. If they teach you meditation, they tell you 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, watch your breath. Oh, that's a very good meditation technique, but I want to get something straight. What's so holy about your breath? Nothing, except it's not your mind. If you watch your breath, wait to see what happens. I guarantee you can't do it for three minutes. You can't watch your breath. You'll be right back in your mind. If you need to, count as you watch. That'll keep the mind busy a little bit. Next thing you know, I, I say count to 20, then go back. Why? Because you'll be at 600 before you realize you're in your mind. You won't have come back. Little by little, just like you learn math, just like you learn tennis, keep bringing it back. Don't fight with yourself, just bring it back. And over time, you'll be able to do it. And all it takes is, I'm telling you, two minutes of just watching your breath and all this energy will come up inside of you and your whole day will change. Two minutes. If you literally lost yourself in your breath instead of lost yourself in your mind. It's a much more beautiful place, isn't it? And then the next thing you're going to know, you're going about your business and life. Somebody's yelling at you. Somebody's complaining. You're at a meeting. Something happens. It starts to get weird inside. Watch your breath. It happens automatically. You just find yourself watching your breath. And all of a sudden, you're not being bothered by things that used to bother you. All of a sudden, you can be present and do the best you can at places you used to freak and waste all your energy being a weirdo. All right. So everybody understand this. So remember, I started by talking about your consciousness is locked inside of an opaque bell. Well, not really. Your consciousness is locked and watching your thoughts that are very little. <laughs> your thoughts are very little. Why didn't she call? That's a very little thought. <laughs> right? It's going to be cold. That's a very little thought. These are tiny little thoughts, aren't they? Right? And you're devoting your life to them. Whoa. I want something greater. You're a great being. Now, what's funny is even just not to devote your life to these tiny thoughts would make you great. The fact that you who's in there devoting your life to these tiny thoughts is it. <laughs> it's the whole universe. It's the greatest thing that ever was. You're the highest thing that ever walked the face of the earth. And the more you let go, the higher you get, the more the shakti and energy pours off of you and everyone who comes near you gets raised and all kinds of stuff goes on. You have to do a single thing. And instead, you're staring at these little tiny meaningless thoughts. You can do this. Little by little, you work with yourself. You train yourself. I gave you multiple techniques. Raise your mind. By all means, raise your mind. But also, let go. Practice not getting involved in the melodrama of the mind. Not through suppression. Suppression doesn't work, right? Relax and release. Releasing works. Just let it go. Let it go. It'll pass right by. Jaggered if.